All right, I'm here with Matt from Matt versus Japan. Matt, how's it going? Hey guys. Yeah, pretty good. Yeah, should, should I just introduce myself? Uh, you, well, I would have given you a little intro before this. So. Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry. But you'll probably do a better job of introducing yourself than I would. So yeah, give us the give us the uh, the potted. Okay, the cool, potted cool. Yeah. So my name's Matt. I have studied Japanese for almost ten years, and I have a YouTube channel called Matt vs Japan, where I talk about not just learning Japanese, but learning any language. And I also run the mass immersion approach, which is a comprehensive approach to acquiring foreign languages through immersion and study, which I uh, run with my friend and business partner, Yoga. So yeah, thanks so much for having me on. Awesome. Yeah. So um, I guess anyone, I guess most of the most of the stuff that I've seen you talk about, at least, or most of the the videos that I've watched of yours have been about um, Japanese in particular, because that's your that's your area, isn't it? Mm -hmm. This is your kind of um, your area of expertise in particular. Uh, but I was kind of the reason that I wanted to 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 get you on and 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 um, and have a chat was because you know I I find that you are you have a, you seem to have a very a very special ability to articulate language learning questions. It's not, which is not something I, I, I see in people um, very often. You see, you, you have a very kind of a very, a very, a very good way of taking really quite complex language topics, the kind of topics that are very, you know, different for everybody and where everybody has a different experience and then kind of distilling them into very kind of simple, pithy um, truths. If you like, mm, and that was that, that caught my attention um, like some some time ago, and I found myself kind of gravitating back to to, to watching your channel um, over and over again. I mean, partly because I have a like a long-standing interest in Japanese um, as well, um, but then you know more and more as I listen to you um, chat and and, to, and talk about stuff, I just I came to really really like appreciate your your way of um, of approaching discussing language learning. So. Um, you know what? What I wanted to do in this in this conversation is really like I, I don't really want to interview you about Japanese or stuff because you know there's a wealth of stuff out there that people can mm -hmm. go and listen to if they want to know um, your your views on how to become fluent in Japanese. And we'll put links to everything everywhere so people can do just that. So I thought we'd just have a kind of wide ranging conversation and and see where it takes us. Um, so I guess like my first question is how did you how do you um, how, how did you develop your your thoughts? And beliefs about language learning. Did it come from uh, like just your experience learning Japanese, or have you have you um, read up on, on linguistics a lot in your own time? How how do you see your your journey of going from um, from zero to understanding language learning in the way that you that you do? Yeah, yeah, that's a re that's a really interesting question. So, I think my first kind of dabbling in thinking about language learning theory, you might say, came from the All Japanese All the Time blog. So, you know, any, if anyone who knows my background, I first got really serious about learning Japanese after I read this website called All Japanese All the Time, where the author named Katsumoto wrote about his experience using really intensive immersion uh, strategies to reach fluency in Japanese relatively quickly. And so he talked a lot about his view of how language acquisition works, which was pretty much the idea that no matter what age you are, you have the potential to acquire a foreign language in the identical way that infants do, which is pretty much just get mass input, thousands of thousands of hours of listening and reading, and through that, your brain will naturally figure out all the details for you. And so I was very influenced by that website because I read it when I was a teenager and very impressionable. And for a long time, I just adopted that point of view wholesale. And I was like, yep, language learning is actually easy. Just listen for 10,000 hours and you'll get there. But over time, I started to just come across things in my own experience which didn't line up with this paradigm. Uh, one of the things that I've talked about a lot in the past is Japanese pitched accent, where this is just one aspect of pronunciation in Japanese, which I seem to not be able to pick up no matter how much I would listen in Japanese. And overall, that kind of got me more critical about, well, how does this language acquisition process really work? It doesn't really seem to be identical to the way that infants acquire languages. There's too many, uh, there's too much contradictory evidence for that. And that just kind of got me thinking and really paying attention to my own experience. Because when I really did start to get curious about this and started to think more critically about it, I already had five years of intensive Japanese immersive study under my belt. So I had a lot of firsthand experience. And there was a lot of things I heard other people saying that I could um, basically deny with confidence in my direct experience, because they would say so and so isn't possible. And I would just know, well, well, 
my experience was that I did do, achieve that. So I know it is possible, right? Like that you can reach the point where you can read Japanese novels comfortably without a dictionary in less than 10 years, like things like that. And so that just kind of got me thinking. And over time, I think once I started my YouTube channel, that also was a really big catalyst to me thinking about language learning theory because I started to be challenged by other people. And so someone would challenge me and I was, I really like engaging in debate and, you know, trying to arrive at the truth. And so there would be a lot of times where I would talk to someone and they'd kind of poke a, a hole in my, my model. And at first I wouldn't want to admit it, but I'd go home and I'd think about it and I'd realize, yeah, that's true. They made a good point. And I'd kind of just start to reconsider and start to explore more possibilities. And, and I would, I have read some of about up about language acquisition theory but my all my experience has been that a lot of that is based off of kind of just hypothetical ideas and sometimes a lot of the, the linguists engaging in that haven't engaged in the act of language learning themselves and so they're not necessarily the most helpful um there is a lot of helpful stuff as well like i'm i've been very influenced by stephen Krashen, for example but but yeah i still i think that it, it's just this process of uh, trying to create a model that can explain everything that I see when it comes to the different outcomes with language acquisition so that you can have some kind of um, system where you could say, okay, with these inputs, what will the, the result be? How, yeah. how, what kind of level will the person reach in what amount of time? And so as I come across more data, I tweak my model so that it can kind of uh, account for that. And I still consider it to be in the process of being improved. I still, you know, take in new ideas and realize potential flaws. And so I don't think I have the final answer yet, but I think it's just been the act of being in this position and engaging in this inquiry. Yeah, so it's kind of a very similar process to me, really. When I, you know, when I first started uh, writing and uh, talking about language learning, which was back in uh, 2013, so like I'm feeling my my internet age now, uh, like seven, seven, almost seven years ago or so. Um, it was sort of the same. Like I, I just spent my twenties learning languages for fun, and then. You know, when you know when you turn on the, the, your camera for the first time and talk about it, your frame of reference is what happened to you, right? And mm -hmm. everyone's got a different experience. Uh, everyone who's learned a language has a different experience, and um, and that depends a lot on on so many different factors, right? So, I guess like so, it's fair, it would be fair to say then that your your kind of models for language learning are like like me, kind of based mostly on our own experience and um, what we've observed about our own language learning journey. Is that, are you comfortable with that characterization or? Yeah, as a, yeah. As a base, although yeah. I have changed a lot of things through engaging with the, my followers and, and the language learning community at large. Yeah, yeah, exactly, so exactly, exactly the, same, the same for me. And so this is like, this is a, one of the things I, I think about quite a lot and which, which is a kind of fair, fair game for, 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 for people like us, right, who are, on, who are basically dishing out language learning advice, which mm -hmm. is, look, what's your evidence? Where's, where's the data? Like, and and it, it's a very, very nebulous subject, isn't it? Because I think it's difficult for any of us to kind of really point to, well, even for the, the, the experts, the people with a, a whole career of research mm -hmm. into this stuff, we still basically don't know anything about language acquisition. Yeah, we know a few things. Yeah, we I point agree. to some yeah. patterns, but we basically just don't know how it works, right? And so, the, the, as I've as I've been um, as I've been developing the way that I sort of think about language learning, um, it kind of went from, hey, here's my here's what my experience has been and what I know to be true. You know, I, you know, so, you know, someone says, oh, flashcards don't work. Uh, and I said, well, I, I've got evidence that shows that they do. So it, that, that sort of approach, right, to, okay, what is, how can we talk in terms which are, which are most helpful to the most people, All right? So kind of finding these kind mm -hmm. of generalities, which, um, which, which again, yeah, which basically going to be most helpful to most people most of the time. Which, so that's kind of this kind of utilitarian view of like, how do you do the best good and what are the things that you can say to do the to do the most the most good so it's it it is a kind of i've always i've often just found myself thinking about about the way that we that we could or should talk about language learning um so yeah do you have any um how how, how do you think about that that aspect yeah well one thing that and actually in the uh, talk that I, I had with uh, Luca Lampariello uh, a few weeks ago, which just went up on, on my YouTube channel, he brought up this framework of principles versus methods. 
Mm. And so the, the principles are just the, like how does language acquisition hap actually happen within the, the brain of people, right? And I think well, this is an idea that Stephen Krashen had that I agree with, is that the, the principles are pretty universal among all people. So, you know, the way that our, the brain works, you know, we all have, you know, the same, you know, prefrontal cortex and the different, the different lobes. And ultimately, I think language acquisition is a pretty natural process for a human. And so it pretty much the, the principles of how it works, how it functions systematically are the same amongst all people. But then the method is how do you take advantage of the, that mechanism and actually apply it to your life so that you can get the results you want. And then the, those methods, I think, might be pretty different from person to person in terms of what's going to work the best because we have different personalities, we have different preferences. And so I, that's where I think there's more room for individual variation. And that's why I think like I specialize in people with a, a personality type, so at least somewhat similar to me. Like if you're an extrovert, it's going to be harder for you to apply my specific advice than if you're an introvert, because one piece of my advice is spending a lot of time getting input from media and, and the internet and recordings and not actually engaging with native speakers at the beginning. So if you're an introvert, that's great because you actually might be pretty intimidated when it comes to the thought of going out and speaking to a native speaker. But if you're an extrovert, that can be really difficult because you have this just desire to go and talk to people, you know? Yeah. So, um, you, you consider yourself an introvert. Yeah, totally. What does it mean? What does that mean to you? Um, well, for, for me, I guess that means like, you know, one framework that I've heard people talk about it with is that uh, if you're an introvert, when you're hanging out with other people, you might really enjoy that and have a good time, but it's kind of slowly wearing a, away at your battery. And then you eventually you reach a point where you want to have some alone time to charge your battery back up. Yeah. Whereas an extrovert is the opposite, where when they're alone, they're kind of wearing up, wearing away their battery. And eventually they need to go be with other people to kind of charge their battery back up. Yeah, it's, it's it's funny, isn't it? Everyone has a slightly different take on that, but I think people do intuitively know whether or not they're 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 an extrovert. I mean, I consider myself an introvert, absolutely, um, but a kind of an, an introvert that enjoys being with people as well. It's yeah, a bit, me too. It's me a too. bit like what you said. You just need that time to actually, you kind of need to retreat into your into yourself from time to time, um, don't you? So just going back to what you were saying about the, the kind of individuality, of the, the need to be individual about your your approach. I mean. We also we all know that, like, as you say, like language learning is a natural thing. We like that that's that's clear. We've all learned our own language. There's plenty of examples of people out there who are who are bilingual, trilingual. Uh, there there is no reason to think that we can't learn a language. And and so for the thing the thing that for me seems to separate, I, I think it's a false question, or a false observation to say that adults learn languages different from kids because because the the circumstances are so fundamentally different, aren't they? For kids. You know, you you have you have just a direct path to the truth in 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 your native language because everything you do is wrapped in this shroud of your L one of your native of your native language. So whatever you do, whether it's talking to your parents, you know, watching a watching a movie, going to school, it's all in L one. Whereas mm -hmm. for the adult, the opposite is true. You've you've kind of you're you're already living a busy life in your native language, and so um, you know even if you could learn languages in exactly the same way as a kid, you've still got the very practical problem that most of your life has lived in, in, in the L1. So, you know, you, the, the, the question for me seems to be like, how do you, even without discussing language learning techniques or anything, is how do you just overcome this practical problem of just spending all day in your, in your mother tongue and giving yourself a, a kind of critical mass of exposure in the target language uh, such that you can go on to, to to actually learn it. It's a real practical problem, and I think for me that 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 seems to be the the, the kind of number one issue around language learning. Before before, like if you don't solve that, nothing else really matters. You know. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Well, there's a lot I want to say on that, but just to rewind a little bit. So, I do think that fundamentally there are some differences between first language acquisition and second language acquisition. Um, different on a, on a totally separate plane than just the practical differences of, you know, we're adults and we have a life that exists in English and things like that. Because I think this difference stems from the fact that assuming you're monolingual, and of course, the same principle applies if, if you grow up being bilingual or trilingual, but it's just easier to understand if we talk about it in terms of being monolingual. So let's say you grew up and you only speak English because that's the only language in your environment. So by the time you will already reach 
between around nine months of age, right? We know from linguistics that you start to lose the ability to hear sounds which aren't used in your native language. And so some people might view this as the brain losing functionality or almost downgrading itself because it's losing the ability to do something it used to be able to do. But from my point of view, it's actually an upgrade because it's optimizing itself to be able to understand the language which is relevant to it, to himself or herself, English, as, as best as possible because there's no need to be able to hear sounds that aren't relevant to, to the language that you speak. And so by losing the ability to hear those sounds, your ability to understand your own native language and to, to differentiate the sounds that, that do exist becomes better. And I think in a way this, that same concept applies to all aspects of, of pronunciation and grammar and, and the way that you phrase ideas and everything. And so by the time that you're like 10, 12 years old, your brain has optimized itself to English so much. It has these very deep pathways and all these assumptions about the nature of how language works that uh, it can be pretty difficult to start a new language and you have to and overcome these assumptions. Right. Like one metaphor that I like to use is that it's like if you had a blank uh, first language acquisition is like you take a blank piece of paper and you fold it into an origami crane. Whereas second language acquisition as an adult is when you take that crane, you unfold it. You have these paper with all these creases and you have to fold it into something entirely new. And you have the pitfalls of these deep creases from the from the original form are going to kind of have this gravitational force that you have to kind of somehow learn to overcome. So I think there is an aspect of that because your brain has optimized itself for, to your first language so much that it is actually harder sometimes to, to avoid getting sucked into the, the creases that are already there. But of course, practically speaking, I would agree with you that the biggest issue is just how do we actually put in the time? Because that, that's the difficult thing. And I think, although in certain ways are, we have a disadvantage compared to infants, we also have the advantage of having our more like cognitive, logical mind being much more developed. Sure. And so we can kind of compensate using that. Like, for example, in my case, I used Anki, which was, you know, just in case anyone doesn't know, it's a electronic flashcard program that has an algorithm that calculates when the optimal time for you to review all of your flashcards is. And so I used this to memorize 10 words in Japanese every day for five years. So I was able to get to the point where I knew, and in some cases, more words, if you're just talking about passive vocabulary, so the ability to recognize words when, when you see them or hear them. I had a larger passive vocabulary than some native speakers my age because I was able to kind of hack the system using this, this software. And so, of course, I still had to put in a lot of time actually reading and listening Japanese to kind of integrate those just individual bits of conscious memory that I created. But overall, using that, I was able to learn words much more quickly in, in the end than it would take a native to do so. So I think yeah. it's about being smart about how we formulate the structure so that we can do more in less time. The problem with dropping something like, I, I, I learned 10 Japanese words a day for five years on flashcards into the conversation is it's very difficult to not just dive into that and, and, and spend half an, <laughs> half an hour talking about it. But I'm gonna try, I'm gonna take that, I'm gonna take that little statement there, put it in a box and set it aside to later because it is it's super interesting. But I, I wanna stay a little bit longer on, the, on, on some of the higher level. Um, ideas before we get too much into into that stuff because that's totally fascinating um yeah i like this origami analogy you're very good with these analogies where do these analogies come from do you sort of do they, does um, it emerge I, naturally or do you do you sit down and i think dream them up well, or or? i think i kind of have a, a natural affinity for it because ever since i was a kid i remember i would come up with these analogies and my mom would be like well you should be a writer you're like good at making analogies but uh, sometimes they just emerge naturally while I'm just doing something else. And sometimes I'm actually trying to explain something and I'm like, hmm, and then it comes to me. Like, I remember one other analogy that I that I uh, ha that I have brought up before is the analogy of when comparing my Japanese ability to my English ability from a subjective point of view and how doing things in English feels like doing something with my bare hand, whereas doing something in Japanese feels like wearing a latex glove where there's just a little extra layer and, and you can't, you don't, you're not as sensitive to, to what's going on. And that one I remember just came to me when I was talking to a Japanese friend um, and I was just kind of observing my own mind and how that my, I had to work harder. My mind had to just kind of like work harder to function through Japanese compared to English. And so sometimes it just comes to me. Yeah. Is this something that, I mean, because it's a very good skill to be able to come up with these analogies, but it's also... You have to be able to, um, a bit like the kind of idea of, uh, of, of deliberate practice in language learning. It's one thing to think of an analogy; it's another thing to actually capture that mentally for later use 
in a, in a video or something like that. And it's a really good skill among um, for uh, you, you see this a lot among um, among teachers and and speakers and um, people who are very good at uh, influence and um, storytelling and things like that. Is this the ability to always be on the lookout for stories? which you can kind of bank and then deploy at different times in order to, to make your make your point. So that's something that you, you've you always always done. Is it something? Yeah, that you well, no, I think I think starting my YouTube channel really is, is what kind of really started this process, because, of yeah. course, once you start actually on a regular basis trying to articulate your thoughts to people, you realize how difficult it is and how hard it is to really get people to understand what you're trying to express. and once this becomes a real issue in your life, that I think it's that that changes your perspective and makes you kind of naturally be on the lookout as you just go through your daily activities for things that potentially could help you in this act of trying to communicate to others. And then also there's this process of like, I'm always talking about the same ideas to different people, right? So I have many opportunities to try to hone in my analogies and my frameworks. I get to see what, you know, elicits a good response from a lot of people, what seems to not really go that well for, with people. And so there's that kind of natural selection process as well. How do you find it on, on, on your YouTube channel? Um, because you, I mean, I've watched a, a fair amount of your, of your content, but nowhere near um, all of it. So I'm probably not, um, I, don't, I, I know sometimes you have these like mega long two hour videos going deep into yeah, some yeah. app or something, which I, I confess I, I don't have the stomach for. Oh, no um, worries, no worries. <laughs> but I mean, I guess so. For for me, I mean, people people watching or listening to this, I mean, on the most part, like if you if you take the, the language learning world, and you slice it into you, the, the, the language learning world, it's, imagine it's a pie, and you're kind of looking at different slices. By far, the biggest slice is people who are just getting started, people who are trying to mm -hmm. you know find their feet with with their first uh, foreign language. Um, but I mean, you spend quite a lot. You're, you're very good at talking about these. I guess concepts that relate specifically to reaching very high levels in a language. And I, I watched mm -hmm. a, a segment of your, um, of your conversation with Luca, actually, I didn't realize it had just come out today. It popped up on my, uh, on my YouTube feed and I, and I was listening to it a little bit in the, I went out for my, 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 it's not a daily shop at the moment. It's like a try to go out like twice a week to buy food as little as possible. Mm -hmm. I was, I was, I was listening to it as I was walking around um, my local budget in the supermarket which nobody's going to know what that is. But um, I, I noticed that, you know, you guys were talking I mean, absolutely fascinating. But I'm, but I'm thinking like, okay, I, I can kind of relate to a lot of this um, from that experience of having got to a relatively high level in, 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 in a language. But most people, that's not where most people are, right? Most people are, are, are kind of um, trying yeah. to find their, they're trying to find the kind of key to the, to the, to the first door in the, in the maze. <laughs> Um, so how do you did you think about how to balance? Yeah, well, the, so that stuff I guess or do you, just do, from your audience, do you get like do people do you find your audience enjoys them the, the higher level stuff? How, how do you approach that that balance? Well, the way that I think about it is that overall the kind of whole like language learning sphere on YouTube and on the Internet is already relatively saturated. So yes, on one hand, it's true. Most people are just trying to get started and that's that's where they're at. But the other thing is that in the saturated market, most people are targeting those people and there's not very many people targeting the few who really are struggling to reach the highest level possible and they've already got the basics down. So in a way, I'm kind of one of the only people who's really talking about these high level things in, in a technical way and giving that a lot of yeah. attention. So although the percentage of the whole that is interested in that might be small, I think I get a huge chunk of that portion, right? They all go to me because there's actually not a lot of competition within that specific niche. And so in a way that works out pretty well. But the other thing, if I'm just gonna be honest, is that that's what just interests me the most. Yeah. And honestly, <laughs> the, be the beginner stages like are just not that interesting to me because the way that language learning works, right, is that there's diminishing returns the better you get. So going from knowing nothing to being kind of intermediate is a lot easier than going from intermediate and being very advanced, right? And going from very advanced to near native is, is, I mean, I don't know if you could say it's even harder, but it takes longer, right? Like it took me maybe two years to go from nothing to conversationally fluent and then three years to go from conversationally fluent to like more comfortable, comfortably fluent, right? So because of these diminishing returns, when I reflect on my language learning journey, the bulk of it was being already advanced and trying to still find out how to get better. 
I, I kind of just blasted through the beginner stages because no matter what you do, even if you have a, what I would consider to be an effective technique, if you just do it enough, you can get past the beginner stage, right? So it's yeah. not that interesting to me in that way. So this, this kind of brings us on to something I wanted to, to, to talk about with you. And I don't know what I'm getting at here with this question. I guess I'm thinking out loud because like, like, like you, like this is the thing. So the thing that I enjoy most on, on my, on my challenge is just having conversations with, 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 with people like you, where we can just kind of discuss things which aren't often discussed. Right. And which, um, totally. which, uh, so I guess, so I, I mentioned this to you on, when we were chatting before, um, you know, on, on, on Twitter before we, um, did this. And one of the things that interests me most is, and I imagine we probably have similar perspectives from, from the opposite end of the spectrum with this, is the, the fact that, so um, you are, as as far as I know, and feel free to correct me if I'm wrong on this, I mean, mm. you you um, have gone very deep on one language, which is Japanese. And um, for for anyone who hasn't heard your Japanese, I mean, it is phenomenal and, um, and extremely rare to find someone who can get to the level that you have in, in Japanese. So I'll just kind of make that clear for people who are, who are, who are listening um and I, I believe that you've you've kind of you're, you're learning chinese now as, as well is that right mm -hmm. Have you, yeah but i'm still still not at a very high level so i'm kind of the opposite in many ways right i i've i've um had some experience in some way or another with about 10 languages i wouldn't say i speak 10 languages because i can comfortably speak five or six comfortably speak five maybe like another three are okay and another two like i there's some knowledge mm -hmm. in there, but I can't really do much with it. But I've kind of, you know, in general, I've gone, I feel like I've gone very, very wide and very shallow. So, um, you know, I've, uh, I've not, I've not, the thing that I have going for me is that I've, I've kind of got experience of different languages in different, different planes, right? Um, mm -hmm. But I, I've, I often feel the, the lack of proficiency in, in, in any of them. You know, and I and I and I see what you've done with Japanese, and I think, man, I, th I you know, I, you know what, I I think I might actually trade all of my languages for one, mm. which is at the level of of your Japanese, and and I guess I'm curious about the um what that experience is like, the experience of of going so deep on one language to a point where um I I think you would say that you're not even you, you yourself would say that you're not um indistinguishable from a native japanese no, speaker no, but... um but you're you know as close as you can reasonably be um in any kind of re you know reasonable scenario uh so yeah I, i'm curious as to what that as to what that's what that's like i mean do you do you see it as how do you see your japanese do you see it as like the stage one of a of, 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 of 10 languages do you see it as like your life's work i mean how what's your how do you see your, your well, japanese what does it mean to you that's actually something that i still like struggle with a lot and it's something that's constantly changing because when i first started learning japanese it was because i felt a very strong connection to the japanese culture mm -hmm. so you know for a lot of times when we're talking about language learning on youtube there's this sense of that languages are almost like these you know, these points that you're trying to score. And if you become a polyglot, you have the most points, you have the most languages under your belt. And it's almost like every language is, I mean, there's harder languages and, and easier languages, but they're kind of all just seen as, as kind of equal. But in my mind, I was really interested in Japan in particular and Japanese in particular, and wasn't really interested in any other culture. And so for me, it wasn't like, I want to be good at Japanese. It was just like, I need to be good at Japanese because I'm going to be spend the rest of my life intimately connected with this culture. And Japanese is, is the my my entry to that culture. And so for a while, I really just assumed I was going to live the rest of my life in Japan. And so it was like, oh, of yeah. course, I need to be good at Japanese. Can you, but, can you do you mind if I just press pause there for a yeah, second? Yeah. Can you just paint, paint us a quick timeline in terms of age? Like where, where yeah, map, yeah, map, totally. that, map that onto the last 10 years for us. So when I was in ninth grade, that was when I initially became interested in so Japanese. You're have to tell me what ninth grade is. I don't know what that um, is. So... <laughs> I think that's like age like 15, Okay. I think, right. 15 or 16. So that was when I initially became interested in, in Japanese um, just because I, I was watching Japanese anime for the first time. And I didn't. it wasn't that I resonated with the content of the TV show that much. It was just something about the language, the sound of it, and um, the like exoticism of it. Something just really captivated me and, and pulled me in. 
And it was really just like a lightning bolt hit me. Like I remember the very moment I decided like I'm going to learn Japanese. And I didn't know really anything about the culture of the language at that point. And so for two years after that point, I was doing more general, like tr traditional language learning stuff. Like I took classes at my high school and I watched, you know, basic like, YouTube videos about random grammar structures and stuff. And then two years in when I was probably 17, I discovered the All Japanese All the Time website and decided to dedicate myself to basically doing Japanese full time and sacrificing everything else in my life so that I could get fluent as quickly as possible. And at that point, I had this very, mis what I would consider now to be a misguided view of how language proficiency worked, where I thought it was like an on-off switch. Like, if I do this for two years really hardcore, I'll master it, and then I'll just be done, and then I'll be perfect for the rest of my life. So that was not how the reality turned out to be at all, but I yeah. thought that's what it was going to be, which is what allowed me to dedicate myself so fully for two years, because it was like, yeah, I'll sacrifice everything for two years, but I'll get this giant return on investment and it'll be worth it. So I did that. But then after after two years, I was pretty good, but nowhere near the like kind of near native level I was somehow picturing I'd be at. So then I just kept at it basically close to full time. And when I was about four years into the full time immersion, I or maybe maybe three, three and a half years, I I went to college and there was a lot of Japanese foreign exchange students at my college and I kind of joined their friend group and I was able to actually start um, using Japanese in social situations and, and make Japanese friends and be speaking it regularly. And um, after another like two years of doing that, I was at a similar level to where I am now. And now for the, it's, it's been about three years since that point where I left college and now use Japanese almost every day to, you know, talk to talk to some Japanese friends online or um, watch TV show in Japanese, but it's nowhere near full time like it was before. So I've said I, I'd say that generally I, I've still improved slowly over time, but for the most part, I feel like I'm at a similar level to where I was after that five years. So in my mind, I kind of like learned Japanese in five years because the first two years when I was doing classes weren't that significant relative to what came after it, and then these last three years also were pretty insignificant compared to those five. Yeah, and now you're what you're kind of what, 24, 25. Yeah, I just turned 25 okay. um, last month. Cool. So, okay, so let's let's, let's backtrack then. So, um, I, I was asking you to to like place Japanese into your your kind of long term vision. So yeah, and you, so, so you spent 10 years at it so far. Or yeah, and I world. guess yeah, and so in hindsight, the I think one of the reasons I was so attracted to Japanese and Japan was because it, it was basically a form of escapism, where I felt like I didn't fit into my own culture. And I felt that, you know, when you go to high school, there's this social hierarchy and most people can perceive roughly where they are on the social hierarchy. And I was not at the very bottom, but I was not near the top either. And this just really was upsetting to my ego. You know, I wanted to be a winner. I didn't want to be a loser. And I felt like I was a loser because I just well, that's how the reality was. And so a way for me to cope with this was to say, OK, well, screw up, screw America. I don't care about this social hierarchy. I like Japan because Japan is, is a superior country with a superior people. So I'm just going to go and become one of them. And that way, I'm actually transcending the entire American social hierarchy. Now, I was totally unconscious of this at the time. It, yeah. it, you know, I, I, in my mind, I was just, just believed that I loved Japan. Japan was amazing. But over time, I became aware that this is what I was doing. And once I kind of took off this lens of Japan is so amazing because I need it to be amazing because that's part of my ego defense mechanism. Yeah. Then I kind of saw like, oh, I don't really know how much I resonate with this, these people in this culture. My personality is actually not very Japanese. Um, now, that's a very interesting. I want to I dive into that a little bit. Yeah. In, in as, as sensitive as possible a way. I mean, say some more about that. So Yeah. So I think what happened was I, in my mind, I had made this. I'd signed this contract with Japan where I said, I'm going to dedicate my life to you. And in return, you're going to fulfill all my hopes and dreams. And I somehow perceived this to be a mutual agreement when in reality it was just <laughs> all my back, like yeah. just me just, you know, bringing all this baggage to the table. They never, so then once Japan I never signed on for that. Yeah, it didn't. But mm -hmm. I just I believed that it had. And so once I started to kind of wake up to the reality that. Even if I went to Japan and got really good at Japanese, fundamentally, that wouldn't solve any of my my real inner issues. I started to feel like Japan had betrayed me because Japan didn't hold up its end of the contract. And so I actually started to have some resentment 
towards Japanese and Japanese people is kind of bitterness. Because I was like, man, I dedicated so much to this and it was all for nothing. So for a while, I actually had this really negative relationship with Japanese. And if you watch some of my original videos on my channel, this really comes through that I have this real bitterness about the whole process. But after um, being at that, that point and taking some, some time away from Japanese, I also got into meditation, which helped me kind of clear my mind more. And I was able to kind of slowly just become more mature and realize, oh, Japan is just Japan. I was the one who had all this baggage and just decided that Japan owed me something when it didn't owe me anything. And I was able to kind of get more, drop that old relationship I had and have a more neutral kind of relationship where I can see Japan has a lot of positives. It has a lot of negatives. It's definitely not heaven on earth. And that's no, kind of where I'm at sure. now. But that yeah. still leaves the question, like, so where do I go with Japan now? Because I have this. Well, yeah. So where, where, so where right? do you go? Where, where, so two questions, like where do you go? And I, this is something I think a lot about, so, but I'll, I'll save that for, for later. Um, where do you go from now? And could you have done what you did with Japanese without this very kind of um, internal uh, status related drive that you mm -hmm. had, misguided or otherwise? Um, could you have done it if you were, say, a more, uh, how can I put it, a more kind of um, content person? Yeah, I mean, well, so I guess so the first part of the question, that is still something I'm trying to figure out because I always think about the possibility of, like, I'm still pretty young. I could start something completely new tomorrow. I could completely drop language learning. I could start, like, programming or, like, go go to college and study engineering or something, start an entirely new life. So I try to keep that possibility on the table just because I don't want to, I think I have the tendency to fall into the sunk cost fallacy where I'm like, I already spent so much time in Japanese, so I need to make sure I use Japanese in my life going forward. But if it turns out that Japan and Japanese is not what my true passion is right now, then it doesn't make sense for me to continue to do that necessarily. But I still feel like I do have a connection to the Japanese people and to the Japanese language because I've spent so much time with it and there is a lot that I like about it and I have a lot of Japanese friends that I that I really like and so I also think maybe something that I can do with this is get serious about trying to help Japanese people learn English because I think especially going forward the demand within Japan for learning English is going to yeah. rise because the more of the the world at large that starts to operate in English the more of a disadvantage Japanese people are at by not being able to use English Mind you, the and same, they're really the same, struggling wouldn't the same have been true like 25 years ago when Japan was like the center of the world and you know the economic boom of the 80s you know i, I mean i th i get the impression that japanese people's english was better back then i don't know if you oh, yeah? if you if you've had the same experience just simply because of the amount of business that was being done between say american companies and japanese companies in the 80s um well i wasn't alive then so it's hard for me to like yeah but sometimes you see really it in, you it. see it in films and stuff i just get the impression that you know people who you know because in japanese film when you, you get these these bits little snippets in in movies and, and, and Japanese dramas where you can tell they've, they've told the actors to say something in English for effect mm -hmm. and they just, <laughs> they, you know, they just really, yeah, yeah. really struggle with it. Um, but you get those same, those same moments in like TV from the, from the eighties and you, you kind of notice that there's a lot more confidence in the, in the delivery. Oh, that's, that's really interesting. And, um, but I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I'd live or die by that, but it's just, you know, these, these, these are little impressions that you have. Um, I mean, well, yeah, I would, don't discount helping foreigners learn Japanese either, the other way around. I mean, they're equally, uh, yeah. equally um, laudable, laudable things to do. Yeah, I mean, for me, because, I mean, obviously, I'm also passionate about helping helping people learn Japanese. Like, that's yeah. what I'm doing right now. So you're already that's doing what the, I did for so long. Mm. So clearly, I'm passionate about that. But I also do think that my content right now, it's in, it's in English and it's largely about helping people learn languages that are not English because you need to already know English to understand that content, at least to a significant degree. And I think because of just the way the world is right now, it's fundamentally different to be learning a language that is English and learning a language that is not English. If you already know English, then the real like benefits to your life on a very practical level, like the financial opportunities that you're gonna gain by learning another language are significantly less than if you don't speak English, but you learn English, right? Because if you learn English, you have access to so much information so we, that we, it's really going to change right? your life. We, we know this to be true. Right? Do you do you get the feeling that Japanese people on the whole also buy into that? On on a, I mean, intellectually maybe, but certainly my memory of Japan is like they, they kind of know that, but then 
they also know i think this is why high school uh is such a <laughs> you know with, with japanese high school kids who have to pass these these english tests in order mm-hmm. to get into university they hate it so much because they kind of see they intellectually understand the importance of it whilst also knowing that you know when they get their big job in mitsubishi or whatever when they graduate university they're not going to not going to get any english at all so you've got this kind of mismatch between the fact that everybody says english is important but the reality of doing business in a in a big um, conglomerate yeah. in Japan yeah. is that actually you don't need any English at all. So do do you get the the feeling that people share people have the same drive to learn English as they might do in say um, Philippines or or Thailand where there is a huge amount of um, I guess there's more social mobility up for grabs in places like that, isn't there? Whereas Japan yeah. is still a very comfortable country to to be in. I mean, my impression is that. Yeah, Japanese people have this idea that learning English will improve their life, but they don't. I don't think they really see the the implications as to why that is the case. It's more like if you speak English and you can get a high score on TOEIC or some other English test, mm-hmm. then that's just a badge you can wear in your chest that is going to therefore give you more employment opportunities. So they're not. I don't think they're seeing the direct connection between if I speak English, I can access more information, I can go more places in the world. It's more like if I know English, then I can put that on my resume and that's going to help me get hired. And also, I think there, so there's that. There's also that Japanese people, again, in, in high school and middle school, they are forced to study English to pass these tests. And that is, for most people, a very unpleasant experience because they're just brute forcing lots of, of complicated grammar structures and just tons of vocabulary. They're not actually getting any input at all. So they have this awful experience that I think leads many of them to walk away feeling like I'm bad at English. Some people have natural talent, but I don't. So English is not for me when really that's just because they used really ineffective methods. But when I actually talk to Japanese people, I don't get the sense that they really understand how much they're missing out on by not knowing English. Like, here's the, so let me, let, let's, let's challenge that for a second. I mean, what are they missing out on? So yeah, they can connect to the rest of the world. Yeah, sure. But Japan has such a high quality of life anyway that um assuming that it's not gonna assuming that they that, that they are gonna have a you know a, a smart person out in the job market in japan is gonna have a job and if they've got a job they're gonna have a pretty good quality of life come what may what is the actual kind of real need for them to uh to learn english like there's there's if you think about the kind of drivers and this because this the reason i'm t- banging on about this is because mm-hmm. this kind of comes back to this whole thing of like necessity and the relationship between learning a language and the necessity to learn it right which is something that right now i'm really struggling with um if you don't have the real necessity to learn something then it's not going to drive you through the various hoops you have to jump through in order to get yeah, good yeah. in a language right and so you compare someone who who's growing up in tokyo and is told they need to learn english uh compare that to someone in you know india who who mm-hmm. is told they need to learn English. For the Japanese person, it's difficult to really point to the material benefits of that in terms of lifestyle, right? Whereas if it's if that's the same, it's the, whereas the opposite is true in the developing world, it could literally be, be the question, but to, the, a matter of, uh, of putting food on the table or not. And so, um, yeah. It, yeah, in, in that sense, there's definitely no need for Japanese people to, to learn English. And most Japanese people do not perceive a, a need. And because overall, yeah, Japan is really self-sufficient as a country. Like there's tons of media. There's, you know, that there's, you can learn about almost any topic, buying books in Japanese. But like for me, because I have access to English and Japanese, I have a, a real perspective on the difference in total information, which is accessible between Japanese and English. And so like, for example, if you want to learn how to program, there's a tiny fraction of the resources in Japanese than there are, than there are in English. And if, if there's some very specific thing you want to learn about in programming, you know, you can just Google it in English and there'll be any number of, of pages come up on Google that discuss this particular issue you want to learn more about. In Japan, there might just not be. So you're much more just left on your own to figure stuff out. And there's a lot of things like that. Also, another passion of mine is meditation. And there's actually much fewer resources in Japanese about how to the technical instructions about high level meditation as compared to English. There's just much more people talking about it. So from my point of view, there's so much more um, valuable information in English than than in Japan. And that's also kind of inevitable just due to the total difference in population, right? There's so many people operating in English on the internet, including most of Europe and, you know, all all these other countries where so Japan just, there's less people functioning in Japanese. So of course there's less total information. 
but they can't see how much of a disadvantage they're at because that's all they know. And Japan is a is a peculiarly peculiarly peculiar. I can't say the word peculiarly self sufficient country, isn't it? In terms yeah, of like yeah. information and culture, you know, they they do quite well. Thank you very much. Like without any interference from the outside, uh, and always have done. So yeah, um, like one, one just really clear example of that is that I know a lot of European people, like Swedish people, French people, who ended up getting really fluent in English because they just started going on the internet in English when they were a child because there wasn't a lot of content in their native language on the internet they wanted to watch on YouTube or streamers or video games and stuff. So they just naturally picked up English. Whereas Japanese people, I, my Japanese friends, they really struggle to learn English because there's you know, an unlimited amount of Japanese content they want to watch on their phone. And actually inspires me because it reminds me that I, I should make excuses because they have a, they have so much content in Japanese they want to watch they have a hard time finding time for English. Yeah, I, I have a funny funny kind of um, experience at the moment, which is that because of my my work, which is which is this, you know, spending all all day behind the computer usually. Whenever when it comes to language learning, I actually I I will do anything but look at a screen. I can't look at screen as soon as I sign off for the day and, and I'm done. I, I can't look at screens anymore. And it's kind of funny because I'm living in this age of unlimited content on demand, but I, I, all I want to look at is a piece of paper, you know, or, or, or another or another human being. And I, and I kind of, I think sometimes like how much stuff I'm, I'm missing out on, whereas everything's there, but I just don't, I can't bring myself to, to kind of access it. Um, so just going back to the couple of questions I asked you before then. Yeah, there was another question, wasn't there? Well, that, I mean, um... I, th I think I, I want to linger on the first one which was um could you have or maybe this was the other one i don't know if you think about the extraordinary effort that you went to to learn to learn japanese and do you, and do you on that point do you consider it an extraordinary amount of effort do you do you yeah think, i yeah. mean i mean it's relative right but i would say most people would consider it to be and i Compared to how I live my life now, looking back, I would consider it to be... Yeah, okay, because I think it is, but just, just to be... Uh, it would have been interesting if you said no, that's why. But um, <laughs> uh, Could you... And maybe we can use this use Chinese as an example here, because, I, I mean, you, you can talk a bit about why you're learning Chinese. I mean, is, is it an area of interest, or is it because you want to... Is it the experiment of applying your method to another language, or, or, or what? But could you have, like, learned Japanese... Could you have worked so damn hard at Japanese, would you, I mean, could you do that again now? Being a more, you know, being five, ten years older, more mature, more, you know, head screwed on. Could you do that now with like knowing how much more there is to life than just learning a language? I mean, well, it's an interesting that you say, could I? Because in a sense, it seems like I could, but would I? Well, that's the question, yeah. Would you, <laughs> probably, yeah. probably yeah. not. Well, the other thing is that due to my personality type, even before Japanese, I really like to get into one thing and just do that one thing very full time. Yeah. And I have a list of other hobbies where, but Japanese was the one that lasted the longest. Usually the lifespan would be about two years of doing one thing full time before I'd kind of get bored and move on to the next thing. But that's just due to my personality. I like just having one thing and thinking about that all the time because it makes my life really simple, right? I'm only doing this one thing and that's it. So I don't, balance isn't an issue because there's nothing to balance. It's all just this one thing. And I really like to, to be totally consumed by something. So I could see myself getting totally consumed in something else because that's just inherently joyful for me. In a way, I think what I like about it is the fact that balancing is hard for me. So I, I just try to avoid it. Now my life does have more balance. I have m much more friends that I see regularly. I do work. I still study Japanese. I study Chinese. I, I meditate and I have, I have other hobbies. I like to do general reading. And so it's hard for me to imagine going so hard on one thing because that would mean not doing all the other things that I like to do. And I, if I had a really good reason to do that, I think I could, I could get into it. I still feel like I have that grinding potential, mm. but it's really, I don't really see a situation where I would decide to make that decision. So, he, so here's the, here's the dilemma then. I mean, so I mean, you, you mentioned your, 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 your method earlier on the mass, mass immersion approach. Um, you'll have to forgive me because I'm not too familiar with the details, but is, when you think of your kind of um, the person that you're talking to with this, are you suggesting or guiding them towards doing things the way that you initially did Japanese? No, or no. Are you, are you talking to the Matt of 2020 who's, who's more, has more varied interests? Yeah. Well, the goal of the mass immersion approach was basically to take the core principles of all Japanese all the time, which are effective. They gave me the results that I was looking for ultimately. 
And first of all, just optimize things, improve things, change the parts of the philosophy that I don't, don't agree with. And, and again, I want to emphasize that I'm doing this with my business partner, Yoga. So I'm kind of the person who's talking on camera, but I don't want to make it sound like I'm just coming up with all of it because he has experience learning three different languages. He's learned um, chi Japanese, Chinese, and Portuguese. And so he has a lot of input, especially when it comes to learning other languages and learning European languages and stuff like that. We, we all have but, we all have secret weapons behind the behind the scenes. I am uh, <laughs> I'm in the same situation. Yeah, and so wait, I kind of I kind of lost my train of thought. What was I? Uh, the 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 so with mass immersion approach, who's the who's oh yeah the yeah yeah. So so the the other main goal of it is to make it kind of flexible so that. Re re Regardless of what level of commitment you want to have, we, you, we can still help you see, well, what's the best way for you to spend that, that time which you've made available? Now, there is kind of a baseline cutoff where, like, if you are looking to spend less than one hour a day on language learning, then the mass immersion approach is not for you. Because in my opinion, if you're spending less than one hour a day, you're never really going to reach the critical mass of being conversationally fluent in a foreign language. No, and it's not to say you can't make any progress. You can maybe start building some sort of foundation that later, if you want to take it further, you can start putting in more time and that, that maybe 30 minutes a day you put in will end up uh, having been useful to you. But if you don't have plans to eventually at some point put in at least one hour or more a day, then really it's, and my, it's not going to amount to any real level of true fluency. And so that's kind of the cutoff of the mass immersion approach. We're interested in helping people become fluent. But not necessarily like a near native level of fluency, maybe just a basic conversational level of fluency. So um, we, we have this kind of sliding scale where we also have like in, um, advice for, OK, let's say you want to put in one hour a day. This is how we think you should spend that hour or you want to spend 10 hours a day. This is how we think you should spend those 10 hours. OK. And it's kind of that sliding scale. And that's part of the goal of it. 10 hours a day, man. I, I sometimes think what would happen if I just spent 10 hours a day on, on my Japanese. It's kind of scary, actually. I might, go, well, the, I might well, go crazy, but well, the other thing is that once you reach a kind of high intermediate, low, low advanced level, then a lot of the time you're spending with the language, it, it's not really like study, right? Like you're just watching TV shows or talking to native speakers, and right. you're just doing activities in the language, and so well, that's that's the um, dream, like tipping point, isn't it? That's that's where, that's the thing which I think for me, I mean, with with my Japanese, like okay, my Japanese is like it's mediocre. Um, I kind of put it somewhere between uh i i find it difficult to map map japanese onto the cefr i don't know if you have any any thoughts on that but I, 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 oh sorry the connection just cut out oh right like so 30 seconds so i was saying that i find it difficult to, uh, 30 seconds did you say how many seconds um maybe what maybe was the last 20? thing what okay. was the last thing you heard <laughs> um you were just saying th the uh, the dream is to become able to oh right yeah uh, so the, the dream is going to get to the point where you can actually enjoy content in the target language for the content's sake right because because you enjoy it mm -hmm. and um and this is something that i that kind of frustrates me with, with 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 my japanese because my japanese is fairly i i consider it pretty mediocre um and i'm kind of i i was, I was saying that i have difficulty mapping on japanese to the cfr in the way that other languages do mm -hmm. um it just it doesn't seem like a particularly useful um heuristic for japanese but um because my Japanese is like, I can do a lot, I can do certain things really well, and other things, other things like not at all, mm -hmm. like such as reading and writing, uh, which is which is a big problem. Um, but I kind of like given with the amount of time that I spent on Japanese over the years, um, the one thing that has kind of permanently frustrated me more than other languages that I've learned is that I I haven't managed to get to the stage where I can kind of comfortably and in, in a relaxed way enjoy content in in, in Japanese because I, I just can't read well enough basically and my comprehension mm -hmm. not not good enough and uh, that's like I, I kind of find myself craving that 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 point of being able to turn watch a youtube video and without any particular effort just enjoy the content like if like that that seems to me to be to be a really kind of crucial um crucial point because at, at that point uh, my, at least my my experience in other languages has been that then it's just a snowball effect after that because you're just yeah you know, yeah so um so that so that's so you said that that's a particular aim of the of the mass immersion approach to get to that point or, or I forget what how well, you're explaining it. I mean, well, I I was just saying that the the aim is is to be able to um, help people who don't necessarily want to commit their whole life to it. Mm. But uh, I was also just saying that like with the I mean, 
before you reach that point, if you're going to put in 10 hours a day, then oh, yeah, 10 hours a day, that's what it was, that yeah. is going to, that is going to be a, yeah. a, a challenging experience I'll say. Yeah. And I think it takes a certain personality type. Like, uh, I think for me, I had double motivation because p- partly, like I said, I have this personality type where I like to really go deep on one thing. And also I had this more like sur- ego survival type stuff going on that gave me extra reason to go far on Japanese. But with like yoga, who the other person who I, you know, we're creating the mass immersion approach together. He more, he also has this personality type where he likes to just go really hard on one thing, but I don't think he had as much of a, um, direct connection with the language he was studying. It was kind of just like, okay, I decided I'm going to learn Japanese. And so because I'm, I decided to do this, I'm going to give it my all. And he would be able to spend like 10 hours a day right from the get go. And he would, he would time box like Anki studying with just immersing. And so he'd like, you know, do flashcards for 20 minutes and then just watch something in Japanese for 20 minutes, even if he didn't understand anything and then just go back, back and forth and just do that all day. And for him, I think just, he could get kind of high on the fact that like, I'm going to improve so quickly because I'm giving this my all. And there is a kind of exil- like exhilaration that comes from just totally dedicating yourself to one thing. But I definitely think it takes a certain personality type to do that. Yeah. So, so let's, tell me about how you're applying that to Chinese then at the moment. Is it something you're working yeah. actively at the moment? Or I'm not sure if it's anything that you're... Yeah, I mean, I go I go on and off. Like, my motivation definitely, like, uh, comes in and goes with the Chinese. And so, like... I'm making pretty slow progress. I mean, I'm definitely making progress over time. What, what, is a day, what, does, I, what does a day look like? I mean, are you, are you still in the, where, where would you put yourself on a, on a, where are you on the proficiency scale? At the um, like, I'm that, actually not that, that familiar with like European scale, but like, um, like maybe like A, A2, okay, maybe. So, so early, early stages still. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So, so like, what is I still a, don't understand that much when I uh, walk okay, student so, content. So you sit down to study tomorrow. What is it? What does a typical day look like? Well, like what I like to do now is I like to watch Chinese TV shows with Chinese subtitles. And for for me, it's a little different because I know Japanese. So I'm really strong with the characters. And I can actually understand quite a bit if the subtitles are on. Because even if there's a word I haven't technically learned, a lot of times just through knowing the characters through Japanese, I can tell what it means. And syntax isn't that difficult when it comes to understanding in Chinese. So... I'll watch with subtitles, and a lot of times, if it's a, a relatively simple show, I can follow basically what is happening in the story through that. And then I will uh, basically take that whole TV show and I'll put it into Anki with the audio. And then I'll make the for, for I'll look for sentences where I know all the content except for maybe one word. And then I will take the audio for the whole sentence and put that on the front of the Anki card. And then I have what that word means and and how you write it and stuff on the back and so you know i'll try to make like five to ten of those a day and so then i'll do my reviews and then i'll just watch the show and then also in the background i might take that same show that i actively watched once and then just listen to the audio on repeat for a while and just mostly focusing on building my comprehension through that and then like yesterday i was i was playing this one um game called vr chat i don't know it's the the popular right now yeah, yeah. So I was actually going in there just to, to speak Japanese, but I came across some Chinese people and I just bust out some super bad Chinese. And and I do find that if for the things that I've been exposed to many times and that I'm used to hearing and understanding, I can replicate that myself because I can just think like, you know, how have I heard Chinese people express this idea and kind of say that? So I found that for the things that I have su- uh, sufficiently inputted, outputting that comes relatively naturally, even though it's still bumpy and I would need a practice to get you know, pronunciation sound better and things like that. But. The uh, the method you described there, I w- I'd love to go deep on that, but I I, I think we, we're going to have to put maybe some recommended uh, resources for people to, to, to go and check out. Otherwise, we will be here until next month. Um, but can I just, just to touch on it briefly, can I take from from, from what you've described there that, you're, that you have an approach of, like, yes, immersion, but also very deliberate sort of... Um, extraction and practice of certain elements of, mm-hmm. of that of that content is that is that is that the kind of two is that, is that a two-pronged approach that i yeah I yeah so like i have like at the immersive immersion approach we have this division between active immersion and passive immersion and so active immersion is when you're giving it your full attention you're sitting down you're not multitasking you're really trying to understand as much as you can and usually you're looking things up at a certain interval and i I find that the most useful way to decide how often to look things up is to almost just have an internal timer. 
Like maybe have a goal to look one thing up every two minutes. Because if you're trying to look up every word, that's just going to basically completely remove all the enjoyment from consuming the show. And if you make this rule, like only look something up every couple of minutes, that will force you to be selective about what you're looking up. You're going to look up the things that kind of either grab your attention or seem to be high value. And so it can help you get into, get into a kind of a flow state better. And so, yeah, you're actively trying to understand, looking things up, making flashcards and stuff like that. And then there's also the, just the actual doing your flashcards, which is also, uh, obviously a kind of form of active study. But then there's the passive, which is where maybe while well, you're cooking, cleaning, exercising, going to the bathroom, you just keep this on in the background. And sometimes you're, you're kind of paying attention and sometimes you you allow your attention to do it, go to other thoughts or whatever the activity you're doing. So it, it's more relaxed. Yeah, that's... um uncannily similar to to the way that i talk about um reading so i have um my i have some let's see i've got something in my books of uh short stories um so i'm not for people who are listening i'm not so subtly plugging on the on, on the camera um so i, I had this uh, i had this chapter in the beginning where i when i to talk about reading as a as a, a as an approach and, and the basic the basic idea is look first step one read to the end of the chapter get your input um, mm-hmm. And then step two, probably go and read it again a few times. And then the next step might be to extract a few, maybe like three, four pieces of vocabulary from that, the ones that jump out that you catch your attention and actually spend a bit of time with those. So you've got the some more extensive stuff, some more intensive stuff. And then exactly like you said, when you're washing the dishes, then put the audio book on and listen to the stuff that you've already read. Mm-hmm. And that way you're kind of getting, you are just approaching it from all these different angles. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's great to hear that you've kind of codified all of that. And I, I look, look forward to, to, to sitting in there and reading some of that. Matt, we're, we're, Yeah, and one other note real quick too, is that like you mentioned how in Japanese you find it really hard to read. Yeah. And I definitely, like for me, getting into reading was also very challenging because in Japanese in particular, there's this huge gap between the range of vocabulary used in spoken language and the range of vocabulary used in written language so suddenly it's like you might have a pretty good grasp on spoken language you try to read a book and suddenly there's like 100 words per page that that you've never seen before and so um for me a good way to kind of get some hang of reading uh without having to like basically the way to bridge the gap was i would watch things with japanese subtitles and that way i can still be learning how these things are are written and getting familiar with the kanji and things like that. But the thing that's nice about watching with target language subtitles is that it's easy to um, not get caught up by your ignorance, so to speak, right? Because if you're reading a book with no pictures, then if you're only understanding 50%, then you're basically understanding nothing, yeah. essentially, right, of what's actually happening. And that's just an awful experience. But if you're understanding 50% of the dialogue in a TV show, well, you still probably are going to have a sense of what's going on because you have the visuals. You can see the characters. You can hear the emotionality and the way they speak and their facial expressions. So it's a lot more palatable of an experience. And you can just use focus on whatever parts of the subtitles that you that look accessible. And that's kind of how I got up to the point where I could read actual books. And Because for me, part of the original philosophy of all Japanese all the time was using native materials as early as possible. And this was something I was very gung-ho about for a while. But... I eventually kind of realized that there's no, it, it was kind of just this this dogma that doesn't necessarily make sense in all cases. Like yeah. I think for some people, dogma for like you basically have, yeah, yeah. Like you, there's basically this trade off between um, when you're consuming native materials that are actually interesting and compelling to you, there is this sort of um, in, engagement that comes about just because you're consuming, you're, you're basically like doing the thing that you want to learn the language for right from the beginning. So. It's like, you know, a lot of people are learning Japanese because they want to watch an anime. So they're watching the anime that they actually are inspired to learn Japanese by. And now maybe they're only standing, understanding 20 percent, but they're OK slogging through that that, uh, you know, fog because they love this show. But on the other hand, you might have a, a graded reader, which they're able to understand 95 percent of. And it's actually a pretty smooth and easy process. But of course, it's artificial, even if it's a pretty well written there's still that sense that, yeah, this is something I'm only reading because I'm trying to learn the language. Yeah. And so there's this trade off on both ends. And I think which one is going to appeal to you depends on who you are. So that's something I think is also kind of like a personality or style difference. Right. And I think what you're describing there is what when, when I chatted with Scott Young, he, he described as the I think it was the principle of directness. Um, so it's the idea that you are when you're trying to learn a new skill. Um, as quickly as possible begin doing the thing that you want to be able to do further down the line Mm -hmm. because then you're going to be getting the direct experience of 
of actually doing that thing and learning all the lessons that come with that, as opposed to you know read, just studying an abstraction in a textbook, which has no no bearing on on how the thing is used in in, in, in real life. Yeah, and so like actually, this is goes back to one of the first things we talked about in this conversation, where you're like, so your advice and your method is based off of your own experience, right? And so, yeah, my experience was I started off with native content from the beginning, but because I was so excited, um, I didn't mind understanding very little. And then at, when I first started making videos, I would basically tell people like, yeah, just suck it up. Like, don't, you know, come on, don't be weak. You can do <laughs> it. Just love. grind through. But then I realized that this is just this is not helpful for, for a lot of people, because some yeah. people, they just it's such an unpleasant experience to them yeah. that they're going to quit if that's their only option. So that's when I became more open minded to, to the more pragmatic means, right? Like whatever is going to get someone to the final goal that has value, regardless of what I think my personal ideal is based off of, you know, my my preference or whatever. Yeah. And that's, and that's the point, isn't it? It's, it's, it's the, um, it's, it's, it's finding that, that synergy between what's objectively the best thing to do. And then the thing that you actually want to do and that's going to get you motivated to do it in the, in the first place. So I think, that completes the circle, doesn't it? I mean, we there's a I've got a list of a million other things that we could talk about, but I think that's uh, we're coming up on an, on an hour, maybe slightly over. And uh, Matt, it's been absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Um, awesome. Yeah, yeah, me too. I had a great time. Good, awesome questions. That a lot of the ones I've never been asked before. So yeah, that was thank definitely. You. Well, fun. that's 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 my generally with these things. I t the way I approach it is well, if it interests me, you know, because like there are th you know when you're watching videos of people, you think, oh, that's interesting, but then it's maybe slightly more personal, right? And mm -hmm. and but I tend to think, well, those, if I'm thinking that, then other people must be thinking that as well. So, so, you know, let's, 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 um, let's, uh, shine, shine some sunlight on those, uh, on those less common things. And, um, but on that point, of course you have a video, you have a, a, a YouTube channel, which is absolutely chock-a-block with, um, more along the lines of what you've been talking about. So maybe, mm -hmm. uh, for people listening, watching, uh, Tell us where would you like people to go to find out uh, more about you? Yeah, yeah. So mainly, you know, there's YouTube channel, Matt vs. Japan, and then the website, massimmersionapproach.com. And if you're really more interested in finding out about my actual recommendations, I recommend going to the website and, you know, f finding the, the overview of the mass immersion approach or, or reading the, the quick start guide because that really will walk you through our ideas without assuming you know anything. The YouTube channel, I worry, can sometimes be a little bit inapproachable just because I am assume a lot of knowledge in each of the videos. But yeah, the website is a good way to get started with my content, I think. Awesome. Well, listen, thank you very much, Matt. And, um, you know, until next time. Yeah, thanks so much for having me.